To look at this New York City Tower from the front view and the side view. It looks perfectly fine here, but if you look at it from its side, it's actually leaning a little bit. The seaport building was meant to redefine luxury living on New York's waterfront. Instead, it stands frozen, unfinished, leaning, and locked in legal battles. This $300 million skyscraper went from being a bold vision to one of the city's biggest construction failures. Hi, I'm Osim Khan, an engineer here in New York City, and today we're doing a deep dive on one seaport building. This is an abandoned skyscraper that no one can actually live in now, but the thing is, it's not falling over. It's only leaning a few centimeters. But you go ahead and tell that to the people who paid millions of dollars to buy an apartment here. This was the kind of place that had it all. A beautiful glass tower overlooking the East River, private terraces to enjoy the view, floor to ceiling windows, and believe it or not, a fleet of private boats for residents. Living here wasn't just about having an apartment, it was a whole lifestyle they were selling. At least that's how it was supposed to be. For any luxury residential skyscraper, the focus is always on what's above ground the glass, the views, the lights. But for skyscrapers, what really matters is what's underneath. And for a 57 story tower like One Seaport, that's exactly where things started to go wrong. The land the building is built on is not even real land, it's man made. You see, the land beneath Manhattan wasn't always there. Centuries ago, this was just water. The original shoreline of Manhattan stretched right here until the Dutch decided to make more room. They filled the area with landfill material to expand the city. Over time, that artificial land would become home to some of New York's most iconic buildings. But here, on the edge of the financial district, the foundation for a 57-story tower added a new challenge. See, New York City is built different, literally. Most of its tallest buildings stand on bedrock only 50 feet deep. That's why you see them clustered in places like Midtown and Downtown. But here, bedrock is much further down, almost twice the usual distance. And to get there isn't just a challenge, it also costs a fortune. You need to drive steel piles 100 feet or so into soil until you hit bedrock. So instead, the developers chose to go down the experimental path. They decided to strengthen the soil underneath the building. Consider this as the base. What they did was inject concrete here into the soil, turning it into a solid mass that would act like bedrock. This meant they wouldn't need to dig nearly as deep, just about 55 feet instead of the usual 160 feet in this area. To make sure the foundation stayed secure, they also would have to lay a concrete mat on top of the solidified soil. And this mat would distribute the building's weight evenly, keeping the foundations locked in place. It seemed like a good plan, but the engineers were concerned with the slenderness of the building. See, the building is super slim. The design's got a crazy ratio, about 1 to 15. And that's where the real trouble lies. Even the slightest shift in the ground below could cause significant problems for a building this tall and thin. And with this bold plan, engineers were already noticing something wasn't quite right. The soil wasn't behaving as expected under pressure. The foundation wasn't reacting the way they'd hoped, but with millions already invested, they had no choice but to press on. And they pushed forward, hoping the soil wouldn't settle too much. But with every passing day, the risk grew higher. And little did they know, the very foundation they thought would stabilize the building was slowly contributing to its inevitable lean. In 2018, a contractor working on the glass facade noticed something strange. The panels weren't aligning the way they should. At first, it seemed like a minor miscalculation, an easy fix in the construction process. But the measurements told a different story. The entire building has shifted 8 centimeters to the side. It doesn't sound like much, but in skyscraper construction, where even fractions of an inch matter, this was a huge red flag. And oddly enough, mirrors proved it wasn't just a small mistake. When a structure moves even slightly, glass panels won't fit. And if they don't fit, something's seriously wrong. At first, workers tried to compensate, tweaking installation methods, adjusting mounting points. But the problems only got worse. Doors weren't closing properly, floors showed subtle misalignments. By the time engineers ran a full structural survey, the situation was clear. One seaport wasn't standing straight. For a while, this remained an internal problem. Only the people directly involved knew. Contractors, engineers, and developers. Then people outside the project started noticing the lean. And this was bad news. Suddenly, the project's reputation, finances, and potential losses were all on the line. Investors backed off, and there was immense pressure. But nothing was worse than the harsh truth. A 700 foot tall building was leaning. At this height, even the slightest deviation from a straight line puts stress on the entire structure. The weight distribution shifts, the forces acting on the foundation change, and over time, the tilt could get worse. And all of this was because they tried to improve the soil instead of digging deep into bedrock. Now to be fair, the method they used wasn't bad. Instead of traditional deep foundations, engineers injected concrete into the loose soil, a process known as jet grouting. It's meant to stabilize weak ground by filling it with stronger material. The fact is, it had worked before successfully, but never for a skyscraper this slender. And the issue wasn't just the soil. 
It was how the building transferred weight onto that soil. A normal foundation spreads weight evenly, but with a 1 to 15 height to width ratio, this thin base met even small variations in ground settlement and magnified into a major structural issue. And that's exactly what happened. The soil didn't behave as expected, a forensic engineer later explained in court documents. It compressed unevenly. The northern side settled just a little more than the southern side, but a little more was enough at that scale to start the lean. If this sounds familiar, it's because we've seen it before. The Leaning Tower of Pisa tilted for the same reason, uneven soil compression. Once the structure starts leaning, reversing it is nearly impossible. And right now, that's not even the biggest issue, because there's something else at play here, something you can't see. Wind. One seaport sits right on the East River, completely exposed. Now, skyscrapers are designed to sway in the wind, that's normal. But because this tower was already leaning, the center of mass was off. So instead of just swaying like it should, the tilt meant the wind could push it even further off balance. An engineer put it best, if you're not staying straight and the wind pushes you, you don't just sway, you lean harder. One seaport being on the East River makes it vulnerable to strong winds. But if this design was this complicated, why'd they go with it? The answer is simple, profit. In New York City, air rights are more valuable than the land it's on top of. Developers aren't just working with the land, they're competing for vertical real estate. The taller a building is, the more units they can squeeze in at the top, which fetches a higher price per square foot. And in the world of high-end real estate, height is a luxury, which means higher price tags. A wider base means fewer floors, while a taller and skinnier tower means more penthouses, more glass-wrapped apartments, and more sky-high sales prices. This is why the super slender trend took off in New York City. These ultra-thin towers weren't about structural efficiency, they were about record-breaking prices per square foot. And the numbers speak for themselves. In 2015, a penthouse at 432 Park Avenue, another super slender skyscraper, sold for $87 million. So when developers looked at one seaport's location right on the East River, prime waterfront real estate, they saw an opportunity. A slim 700-foot glass tower packed with luxury apartments selling for millions each? That was the plan. But plans don't always count for physics. And when profit is a priority, everything else takes a backseat. That brings us to Fortis Property Group, the developers behind one seaport. Now, Fortis wasn't just some unknown developer. They had experience with high-end products, residential towers, luxury condos, and commercial buildings. But here's the thing. They weren't known for engineer marvels. They were real estate players. Their focus wasn't on pushing the boundaries of skyscraper design. It was on flipping high-value properties and selling the dream of luxury living. And when you're selling luxury, the foundation is what makes the headlines. It's the marketing, the floor to ceiling glass, the waterfront views, the exclusive status of living in a tower like this. And in this case, that's where things started to go wrong. Because instead of investing in a deeper foundation or incorporating redundancy systems to account for potential settlement, they took a calculated risk, a gamble really. And let's just say, in the world of construction, not every risk pays off. But in April 2016, when they opened pre-booking, the response was astonishing. Buyers rushed in. On the very first day, 20% of the units went under contract. Some units even got sold for $18 million. And Fortis even estimated that it could sell 80 condos for a total of $272 million. On paper, it looked like a massive success. Investors were happy, buyers were excited, and Fortis was making money. But while the marketing team sold a vision of sleek perfection, the structure itself was already shifting. The cracks, both literal and financial, were forming, and it wouldn't be long before everything started to come out, because with this, the problems started showing up faster than the solutions. Now by 2018, the lean was undeniable. Engineers tried to fix it, but the damage was done. Contracts fell through while investors got nervous and lawsuits started piling up. And by 2019, 161 Maidenly wasn't just another luxury tower, it had become a battleground. On one side, Pizzerati, the construction firm that had been hired to bring the project to life. On the other, Fortis Property Group, the developers who wanted it built as quickly and cheaply as possible. And at the center of it all was a fundamental decision about the very ground the tower stood on. That year, Pizzerati took Fortis to court, claiming the developers had made a fatal miscalculation before construction had even begun. Instead of using foundation piles like the surrounding buildings, Fortis had opted for a soil improvement method, a cheaper and faster alternative. According to Pizzerati, there was just one problem. They were never told about it. By the time they realized what was happening, it was too late. The building had already begun to settle unevenly, tilting by 8 centimeters. And that wasn't just an aesthetic issue. Pizzerati warned that left unchecked, this lean could cause facade panels to detach, metal components to corrode, and even elevators to fail. The company walked off the project, terminating the contract and leaving the tower in limbo. 
Fortis had its own version of events. They claimed Pizzerati had failed to do the due diligence before starting work and that if anyone was at fault, it was a contractor, not them. To back up their claim, Fortis had brought in two major engineering firms, WSP Global and the Arab Group. The conclusion was that the lien wasn't dangerous, so Fortis decided to make a change. They brought in Ray Builders to take over from Pizzerati and continue the project. The issue was that the damage had already been done. All the prior issues had a real impact. The lawsuits, the negative headlines, and the concerns about the building's design. Things slowed down considerably and construction actually paused for several months in 2019. Then in 2020, Ray Builders stopped working altogether, claiming they hadn't been paid in months. And by 2021, things got even worse. The New York City Department of Buildings issued a stop work order after Ray Builders formally walked away. At that point, the project wasn't just struggling, it was frozen. And then there were the banks. Curtis has secured a $120 million loan from Bank Lumi to fund the tower. But after years of stalled progress and legal battles, the bank sued Fortis for breaching their contract. They demanded foreclosure. And in June 2021, the court placed 161 Maiden Lane under receivership. Today, the tower still stands unfinished as a monument to high-stakes real estate gone wrong. It's not collapsing, but it's far from stable. The legal battles could drag on for years, but one thing's already clear. 161 Maiden Lane is one of the most expensive real estate failures in recent history. But perhaps the most important question here is what happens next because there aren't many good options. You could try to fix a foundation. It would cost tens of millions of dollars and require extensive structural work, if it's even possible. Selling the property could be difficult as well, especially with a history of lawsuits and a visible tilt. And lastly, if you would consider demolition, that would mean admitting complete defeat. So 161 Maiden Lane is gonna be remembered one way or another. It's a reminder that in a city where building happens so fast, sometimes things can get overlooked. The race to make a profit can sometimes take precedence over careful engineering and taking shortcuts can lead to serious issues like we've seen here. Truthfully, New York's always been about going big. Bigger, taller, sleeker is often the mantra. 161 Made in Lane though, is a reminder that these kinds of projects are complex and there's always a risk. It wasn't just one thing that went wrong here. It was a series of failures across the board. Let me know what you think about this project. Until next time.